So we have two more topics to go. This one is on uh, financial models, which is really going to help you answer, if you're in the competition, your financial question uh, in your competition uh, round two submission, which you'll get details on soon. Uh, and it's also just an important part of your business. So Sean's going to talk a little bit about that. I think he gives you some tips and examples from the competition, because Sean is another person who's been a, a long-time volunteer as a judge and also speaker and has also been in the competition. So he's got, he has experience from all angles as well. So I'll let Sean introduce himself and take it from here. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Everyone can hear me okay? Nice to meet everybody. I would, I would describe this maybe as uh, an ask me anything question as well. I've been doing this, this is actually my 10th year presenting and I've been involved in the tech startup community for north of 25 years. So um, just, and on the, off the top here, I'll just ask that question. Has anyone seen my presentations from the prior years? Because it, it does get, okay, I've got one. So I'm just, how creative do I want to be? Because I didn't update a ton of slides, but at the same time, some of the fundamentals of these financial models are consistent year over year. So um, just a little bit of a backstory. So I'm a CA CPA. I, I articled with Deloitte here right in when British Columbia was transitioning from mostly resources to tech. I'm a passionate uh, advocate of technology and I've been doing that most of my career. Uh, and then I went down to PricewaterhouseCoopers just at the tail end of the tech bubble in 2000 and I experienced a rather fantastic experience down there. Um, and interestingly, just came back from Palo Alto, reconnecting with some old colleagues um, from PwC. So um, I've gone on to be in the fractional CFO space. So I've literally been into hundreds of startups and I applaud all of you for doing this. Um, entrepreneurship is such a fantastic uh, and exciting and interesting realm. I think all of our academic schools need to do more to, to, to encourage entrepreneurship. So I applaud all of you for doing that. I myself am an entrepreneur uh, in a Tandem Innovations, Tandem Accounting Group. Tandem Innovation Group is a network of over 300 fractional CFOs. Um, now beyond just accounting is which where we started into HR and marketing, uh, bookkeeping up to CFO. And then a couple of the ventures that we also um, not only supported as fractional CFOs, but we started to invest into those because when we meet you, it became quite clear that some of you will be very, very successful and making a, a bet on your future success uh, might be a good investment and that has proven to be the case. So we've started two venture funds on the backs of some good successful early stage investments and that's Red Thread Ventures and in British Columbia here we have uh, Venture Capital Corporation. On that note, is anybody here familiar with the Eligible Business Corporation rules, EBCs? Okay, good. Okay, we'll touch on those or I'll encourage people, if you're not putting your hand up, then maybe ask questions later if I'm not getting to them in the presentation period. Okay, so uh, as Angie said, we all, I was also a participant years and years ago, like 16 years ago, so, and it was a company called QC Docs. I had moved from California up to British Columbia. I was still the controller at that time for a biotech company called Lumasite. This is when cloud, well before cloud accounting was a thing, but long story short, I was like, oh, I'm gonna build a software company, and I did it, went through the competition, and I learned so much from the process. So I will put that out there, is that, you know, this is a great competition to learn. <laughs> of course, we didn't win, but at the same time, that's just, that would be a bonus. So I, I, I'd encourage you not to take that success marker, obviously it would be fantastic, but use this as a journey to learn, meet people, we're here to support your business and your ideas, and that's where you'll get from it. Um, a couple of things, get, I'm also a, a judge too, so I see like common patterns in submissions. You know, get yourself a good editor, okay? Make it clear and professional at the end of the day. That's what this business case is. Basically, you, you know, can, you're canvassing for investors. Like, that's the, effectively what you're trying to do. Be real and use case study examples, and we'll talk about that when we dig into the financial models. Like, what are you trying to do as you build, build your financial statements? 
be a confident thought leader. Um, I'll talk about like TED Talks. Like that's, that's a little bit of building a business is about sales as well as then being a domain area expert in something, right? So be confident with whatever you're putting forward. And then the financial model, obviously I'm an accountant, but I'm also been through this entrepreneurial journey many, many times and seen some tremendous successes, perhaps some tremendous challenges on the other side and how important the financial model is. The financial model actually evolves beyond just telling the future of what you think your idea might be to get interested investors putting money into your investment, but it also becomes your budgets, how you're running your business month to month. And good financial models should do that. Okay, and then last thing, don't, and hopefully we can get through the content quickly so you can ask lots of, lots of questions. I will also throw out one other question for folks. Who's here with like a concept business model as opposed to you already have a business and you're generating revenue? So first on the concept side, you've got a concept. Okay, great, that just helps me kind of, and then everybody else assume you're, you've got a business or you're still contemplating or you've got a revenue generating business? How many of those are there in the audience? Okay, so fantastic, okay, great. Okay. So financial models, what, what are we talking about? So fundamentally, we're looking at projections, not, not only historical, so historical financials would be relevant to those companies that put their hands up that have already been s selling something, right? Incorporated their business, I think Cynthia hit on that. What stage of, are you at? So your financial statements would not only be your historical, you've set up your QuickBooks, you've gone to your lawyer, incorporated, got a bank account, you start paying your employees, and you're actually starting to run your business. So you've got your historical financial statements, as well as then your three to five proje year projected. And that would definitely be the concept ideas, as well as those operating businesses. You want it to show us in the future what your financial statements are gonna look like, okay? So that's the essence of financial model, okay? Um, GAAP and IFRS, so generally accepted accounting principles, okay? This is foundationally what you want your financial statements to be. You don't need to be an accountant to produce these, and we'll dig into the, to that and some of the best financial models I've seen. I haven't come from accountants at all. Um, international financial reporting standards. So there's obviously standards of what you're putting together, but that at the end of the day is probably less relevant than the fundamentals of your business model that we're gonna dig into, okay? And what does it entail? Three things fundamentally, balance sheets, your profit and loss statement, your income statement, and your statement of cash flows. And we'll look exactly at what, what we're talking about here. And first of all, <laughs> this is your chance to build your business in Excel, right? I don't know how many times I've kind of seen this over the years. It's like just build your business theoretically in Excel to start. Right? Because this is where you can play around. This, to me, as kind of my entrepreneurial journey, is like you will, you will love your Excel spreadsheets. All the engineers that I've worked with over the years that have been really good entrepreneurs, they bring me their models. They're already working in Excel. Uh, so that's, what, th that's your chance. Like this is all the rest of what you're putting together with your, with your business plan, your marketing strategy, all the rest. This is where it all comes together. Okay, this is where it consummates, this is now an investable opportunity, okay? So that's why it is so important. And then it's like, what's coming out of the financials? Because it's, it's accounting, it's boring stuff, right? Well, we'll try to turn that a little bit to, well, what are the real important drivers of the business? How many employees do you have? Like, what, what are we conveying out of the numbers that make your story particularly interesting, okay? And then, of course, this is the essence of how do you arrive at a valuation, right? So I, I don't know how many people are always asking, well, how do I value my business? It's almost invariably an eye of the beholder. I'm sure Mr. Volker will dig into that, who's the perennial investor, um, angel investor, will dig into like, the essence of valuation. But at the end of the day, it, it is fundamentally a driver on your financial models, okay? Okay, so there's kind of six six step journey in building out your financial model in my perspective, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through each slide. So 
It's basically, you, you know, your market analysis and opportunity analysis. Some of that will be somewhat familiar to many of you. Cash to re or sales to revenue to cash is an important kind of mechanics of your business model. Key performance indicators, gross margin, which is really at the end of the day the aha, this is why I'm actually investing in your business. And then milestones, you know, when do you, when do you get to the point of getting your first NRCI wrap grant or when do you file your shred and when do you get to your first you know, 10,000 customers, whatever, whatever those milestones are because those usually correlate to some valuation inflection point. And then finally is just the importance of case studies. <laughs> it's just so very important. Okay, so the first one is this market analysis. And I, this is the change. It's like I put the big X in there because everybody, it's like almost all abused is this concept of, well, what's the industry that we're in? And we're going to get like a small percentage of a huge industry. And that's what's the compelling business value. This is the essence of your, your financial model. That it's, it's overused and it's not really telling the important part of your financial model story, okay? You need to, you need to kind of build it up. So that, I describe that as kind of the top-down view. So it's like whatever, pick your industry sector. And it's like, sure, you've got a story that talks to a problem and you've got a solution, you're gonna pick up some percent. You gotta go the other direction. That's again, comes, comes from this case study example where you can really articulate kind of TED Talk style, like here's what's going on that's a real problem, okay? And then enlighten us with, okay, here's a solution that, that will capture some percentage of, the, of this market. And you do it one customer at a time that somebody can extrapolate. This is building your financial model up from the ground level up. And the companies in the competition, and frankly, companies that raise capital that do a very good job of building their financial models this way are way, way, way more compelling because they're very much easier to understand. And that little thing over there is just, everyone's just like, show it to you, it's like, oh, skip the slide. Because it doesn't mean anything, right? It, it speaks to the, okay, I got a big opportunity. So that's, that's where I'm kind of pushing you to like, pick up the Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, speaking further on this one, I wanted to ask for a case. Sorry, thank you. So delving in a little bit deeper onto this one. Oh, my name is Raul, I'm with uh, Spark GG. Um, I wanted to ask, could it be a great opportunity to speak more on that industry itself? Maybe it's not a niche market or you want to give context to, let's say if you're presenting it to an investor, of what that industry looks like. So you give a snapshot, but not talking more so about your role in it, but how you can grow within that industry. Could that be a good case for this or? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 exactly. That's what I was saying. Like, don't dismiss the concept. It's a very important concept. I'm just saying you actually want it to marry it up to it, right? So it's like, yeah, pick your industry sector and then, but build it, build your financial model one customer at a time, and then you can bring both stories together. I'm just saying that historically people just, just do it top down. They don't spend any time in Excel building it the other direction. And it's, it's almost like, just, just get away from that to start. But you're right, it should really come together as a perfect storm of both stories. This side is the part that's, that's under, underdeveloped in most of these case studies, okay? Or m most of these submissions. Uh, okay, so yeah, and then, and then at the end of the day, it's like, you, you know, what are you doing? Is it a cooler product? Is it better marketing, cheaper? Do you have first mover advantage? Do you have patent protection? Are you doing something that nobody's done before? So all of these things become critical elements of your business plan and your submission, but it has to then correlate to, well, how is it showing up in my financial statements, right? So, you know, and we'll look at that. So that, that, that's where it's, the financial statements become a way for you to connect your story with an understandable form for which investors can evaluate, okay? 
Um, step two, so opportunity analysis. So this is, this is another area where it's kind of delving a little deeper into what that kind of target market is. And how do you sell? How many people come from a business academic background here? Not too, okay, I'm su surprised, okay. So yeah, I would, I would, I'm, I'm a UBC commerce grad, and uh, so I always look back at why there's no sales, and perhaps it's changed, it's a long time since I'm with UBC, but SFU, UBC, you go, you got your finance degree, your accounting degree, your marketing, real estate, what about sales, <laughs> right? It's like the essence of business. So what over here is, is, is basically a picture of a customer relationship management solution like Salesforce or HubSpot, and it doesn't even hit your financial statements, right? And this is also another part that you need to understand has to be model. So you don't need, like CPAs, yeah, we're dealing with your gap financial statements, but your opportunity analysis, which is the sales force terminology for when you go to conferences and you're meeting, I got this next greatest product out there, and you're exchanging business cards, and what you're doing right now with your concept, you're trying to sell, okay? That's all about opportunity, getting a pipeline. Oh, I got somebody who's got a problem, I got interest, and, and you gotta figure out in your financial model, in your Excel, how are you analyzing this huge pipeline, which is the whole industry, right? That's where I'm kind of trying to connect the dots between this idea of, okay, we're, we got a problem, and we're gonna go in. Now, you need to have a systematic way to sell, right? You need to have a strategy on what it is. What is the problem? Because as you start to sell to each customer you're working with, you need to, you need to be able to articulate and you need to understand what their problem is. Um, that's why domain area experts are often the best entrepreneurs because they've come from some experience where they're oh, frustrated and they're like, I just gotta go fix this problem and then they start building a solution for that. And that's where this opportunity analysis comes in. As well as, as a CEO, as a founder of the business that you're looking to, to start, you have to sell. Right? So this is back to, you know, where are in the academic world are we with just simple sales? So that's why I applaud all of you. You're here, and I assume because you've got the ability to sell something. Not only a product or service, but also an investment in your company. So both of those things are big sales prospects, right? Uh, okay, so yeah, so it's really just this concept of understanding, build your model from real practical things. Do you have a price sheet? Do you have a sales brochure? Because that is some of the fun stuff, the marketing. But it also puts you through the cycle of thinking about these problems. But then you can come back to your financial model and build it out in a very practical way. Well, here's the price sheet. Here's what we're going to do and discount and come up with it. And then just lay it all out in a time horizon. And that's how you build out your model. But it all starts with selling it first. You got a, s a whole sell cycle before you send out an invoice to a customer, right? So that's, that's, that's the nature of, of this. And it's really just your ability to tell a story through the whole case submission that comes all together in the financial section, okay? Any questions on any of this? Yeah. I, I was thinking. I was about to type on the digital conversation, but I was thinking, can you turn this pipeline uh, on its head? Meaning, if you were B2B, could you start with a couple of customers that would then love, love your solution? And then from there, it's a case study kind of yes. thing. Right? And from there, grow your, your whole target market. Right? Could, could that work? Absolutely, yes. Like that, that's, that's foundationally what you want to do, right? Okay, you, you pick an industry and there's like 10,000 prospective industry clients in a B2B opportunity. Start with your first one, right? It may be the company you just left that you were frustrated by. And now you're just going literally back to sell them a solution and like, yeah, you're right. And I will invest into you and help you build that out. That becomes the essence of how you build your whole business. Um, 
yeah, I'll maybe tell a story at the end on, on, on a local entrepreneur who did exactly that. I would put, put him in as a case study of an amazing entrepreneur here locally um, who, who, who's seen that kind of vision twice happen to tremendous success. But that's the idea. Yeah, prove that you can sell it to somebody um, and then use that as a case. Get the testimonials, put it into your brochure, determined collaboratively with that first customer, what's the right price point, maybe give them a discount. You know, that's the essence of sales, right? But this becomes, this is how you can support and build out your financial model. Start with one customer at a time, then you go to 10, 100, 1,000, right? That's, that's the way to build a great financial model. Okay. All right, Sean, there was a question on your Tam, Sam okay, yes, slide. Yes, yes, yes. Which is just to clarify, are you saying to not give a TAM, a SAM, and a SOM slide, or just to go straight to SOM, or no, they say no. ARP to company revenue? No, keep it in there. I was just kind of being che a little cheeky with the, it's overemphasized. Build your financial model separate from that, and the financial model should marry up to that other slide. It is relevant and important, but it is overused is, is the main point I'm trying to make there. Okay, this is, this is the mechanics of your financial statements, but it's from a sales perspective. This is where it's like kind of important to understand. There's more things than what happens when you put it into your QuickBooks accounting system, right? I talked about the opportunity analysis, sale. So when you, Enter into a sale, it depends on what the, how many like software companies here, like SaaS companies or software? Yeah, quite a few, not, not surprisingly. Um, any services businesses? Great, how many, how many like hardware or product sales? Okay, perfect. So how you sell these things is considerably different. Like if it's a SaaS software, you're just getting a subscription, a software a credit card, and then they're, you're giving them access to an online software is pretty, pretty common. In the olden days, we used to sell software in bundled licenses in years in advance, and, and they would pay for maintenance and, and support, and you would bill them in advance. That became ridiculously complicated, so SaaS became a thing, and I, I would say that accountants had a lot to do with that. But at the same time, it's the evolution of the internet, et cetera. If you're selling products, that's a different thing. Is it a store? Is it some customizable hardware that's going into a plant somewhere? Are you going to bill them in advance because you need to build it just in time? How are you going to invoice it? When are they gonna pay you? All of these are really important questions. Do you have to enter into a sales contract with the customer in advance? That's usually what happens. Guess what? A sales contract isn't something in your QuickBooks accounting software. So you need to, well, how are you going to do this? You know, you got to sell your products first, your services first, and then you give it to your bookkeeper or your accountant, and they are sending out invoices. You may send them out an invoice in advance. Hey, you've ordered Mark our parts, you've ordered some equipment or services in advance, you collect that. We still haven't even got to revenue yet. When does revenue happen? This is your, okay, a little bit of textbook accounting 101. When does revenue happen? We sold some stuff. We've entered into a contract, but when does revenue happen? When it's like a you pay. When does that pay? Pay, that's one, one answer. Anybody else? When do you use it? When do you use the software? That's payment terms, that's another good one. Uh, you, so you recognize it. Uh, you, you, you recognizing is getting close. When, you've earned it. when, you use when it? you've earned it, okay? It's, so it's, this is theoretical accounting, right? But it's also really relevant to understanding your business and how you're, what you're actually doing, what's going into your accounting software. But all, you all picked up on super important things. A lot of things happen at different times. Like I could be a software company building AI solutions and I'm gonna enter into a contract for $50,000 and we're gonna dedicate some resources and software to build something and we enter into a contract, this is the duration of it, and I send out an invoice for 
you know, half of it in advance so I can dedicate my team to work on it for a period of time. It isn't until the work actually gets done that it's earned, okay? But we may very well have sent the bill out, collected it, put it into our bank account, net 30 or whatever it was, but we don't start to radically recognize the revenue until it's being delivered, okay? Now, it be, may be augmented by the use of tools like AI or other things, but these are just the important things, and why I'm asking it in this fashion is it puts you in the point of you're sitting in front of your Excel spreadsheet, building your financial model. You kind of need to know how all these things happen and where they show up. Okay, so when you send out a retainer invoice or you're selling, you sell something and send them an invoice before you ship the product, this is just a deposit. Okay, you collect the money, it sits there as a kind of a temporary deferred liability or deferred revenue and then you bring it through. So it's a little bit of accounting for sure, but at the end of the day, it's as simple as what all of you said. There's little nuances that are not hard to understand on the mechanics of what you're doing to sell your product. And that's where I'm pushing you all to, in your Excel, just do it at a very simple level. Okay, this is when we enter into the contracts, this is when we send them the invoices, it might be net 30, it might net be net 15, and this is when we're gonna collect the cash. Sometimes they won't collect the cash at all. Why wouldn't they collect the cash at all? Let's assume that you delivered your software and they don't pay. Like, what's the, what's the, what's the issue there? Your software sucks. Your software sucks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, guess what? The world's real, right? Financial models are real. You gotta deal with stuff. Churn. Right? Yeah, you will use it for a while and then, ah, oh, this is terrible, I'm done. Like, but this is KPIs, like this is the essence of telling your story, this is the essence of putting it all together, and even the way I'm kind of doing it in a loose fashion is, it's very easy to understand. You don't need to be an accountant, but you do need to understand what's happening in the process, okay? And yes, the revenue recognition, the concept of earn, you know, is probably good to have an accountant on your team. Of course, I'd be an advocate of that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's more about you understanding what you're selling, how you're selling it, and how you're collecting cash at the end of the day. And delivering a product that they are happy to buy again and tell their friends to buy it as well. So that's, that's, that's a very investable story if you can get it all together. Any questions on this? Okay. Okay, this is the, oh wow, this is a really good business slide. Okay, and I, 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 because Cynthia was my um, uh, ITA uh, for Matza, coincidentally. So I was a CFO for two past, I think they're top five uh, winners in the NRC IRAP competition, Meta Optima and Matza. Both fantastic businesses. And this one is just the elegant business model that I kind of almost come back to because it's such an easy thing to explain. But I'll tell you, when I first saw this deck, it was probably. 50, 50 odd slides, it was very technical, and it was really hard to understand well, what the value proposition of this business was. That's because it was a very complicated science project, per se. It was, uh, uh, Dr. Matze developed a proprietary way, a patented way to uh, extract phytochemicals from plants without using ethanol and other rather bad for the environment type chemicals. So he would use this patented water, pressurized water technology to extract from those, can people see, cranberries, okay? Something uh, of a particular value that we obviously, if you're in the lower mainland, you're familiar with cranberry production. What do we produce with, from cranberries? Cranberry juice. Cranberry sauce, and guess what's left over? Pomace, this discarded waste that at best would go for as fertilizer. Everyone's familiar with apple? <laughs> the, the skin of apples is in fact where all the good nutrients are. So this technology would take spent pomace from cranberry farms and put it through this proprietary technology that was just a little bit of 
well, a fair amount of water, but not a ridiculous amount, electricity, and a bit of human intervention and engineering, and they would extract um, proanthocyanidins, an extremely valuable compound out of the skins of this palmus. We could buy a ton of spent uh, cranberry palmus for $1,000, or for, for yeah, $1,000, a ton of it. And then we could run it through this process and get 43 kilograms of 8% proanthocyanidin. I've got to go back to remember it. That would sell for about $11,000. Okay? $10,000 for every ton of cranberry that everyone else is like selling for dog food or fertilizer. What a great business. And at the end of the day, despite the complexity of the intellectual property and all the patents in place, a really, really investable story. Okay, so we raised a lot of money, built a plant in Delta, ultimately sold out to Sentient and off to the races. Something that all of you should aspire to do. Um, so that's, that's the idea here is get, get, get it, get your, try to get your story to a point where it's very understandable. 11,000 cogs plus water and electricity is 1,000 plus whatever that incremental cost is, a huge gross margin, right? That's where it becomes the wow. If you can sell a lot of this stuff at very high margins, or you can sell a ton of stuff at smaller margins, this is where the investors get really excited. So this is where I would encourage you to spend your time really thinking about the problem and solution and how this all comes together in a really compelling gross margin story. Any questions here? Way at the back. All the way at the back. Wait for me, please. Oh, what's the question? Oh, here you are. Perfect. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, our uh, business is uh, introducing uh, raw materials outside Canada. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's getting retail sale, like in Europe and Canada and the US. I, I, I apologize. Can you just speak up a little bit louder? Yeah. Our product uh, is coming as a resource uh, from uh, East Africa and West Africa. Then it goes to Europe and you know Canada and USA. Uh, it's true that when the products come, as you said, it's coming really cheap, like low price. But once it's uh, coming on the retail parts, it's, it's like thousands times fold. But what happening that now uh, with the EU uh, uh, sanction is going on because the farmers keep uh, uh, deforesting and planting so many coffee plants. So it's affecting the carbon emission. So now the EU is coming back again and making sanction to some of the countries who are expanding uh, these plants because they need some kind of turnover for the price they are selling. So they expanded too much so that they could be, you know, survive there. So uh, now we are trying to make it back again. Uh, at least we need to compensate the very farmers on the ground level. We are having the same issue in Canada, like most of the barns and the farms are, you know, no more in encouraged to continue because they are not compensated well. So we are coming back again to, to, make, to share some of our profit margins with them again. So. How do we see that uh, this project in a sustainable point of view, sustainability point of view? Uh, that was a, a long question. We may want to take that off offline. Um, I'm not sure I entirely. Okay, let's make it short. How would we gonna to make the business sustainable by encouraging the farmers who are producing, let's say, the strawberry because they are selling it cheap, but when we put it in the processing units, we are having more income. But the farmers are getting discouraged and they are leaving the farm. So how do we encourage them by well, sharing our incomes? Let, 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 let's t take it off offline, but let me put, I think, your question back to this matzah example and in, in a way that this perhaps speaks to a greater value creation, right? Like the first, to the point of what the underlying story of this one is not using ethanol or 
you know, acetone, these really nasty chemicals that were used predominantly for making you know, vitamins and other nutrients in Asia that are bad for the environment. And here's a technology that uses water okay, to do the same thing um, and, and, and also to the farmers. Like there's value creation from this technology that we're taking these pomace that as human beings we don't like to eat because it's not flavorful, but is in fact where all the healthy nutrients are. So better for humanity, better for the farmers if you can give them a better premium for their product because just supply and demand. Now you're competing with the, the fertilizer companies and the pet food companies. Now there's another buyer, right? So now the farmers are doing better. So yeah, to the degree you're doing something that speaks to any of these other environmental issues, ESG, and bringing that in as a compelling value proposition to the, okay, this is, this is going to increase the amount of supply, right? Right, like that's the story. Oh, we are gonna be able to compete. It's a better story. More of the farmers are gonna give this. We'll pay them more. That's how you get to tens and thousands of tons of crap. So that's where, yeah, piece it all together. I, I'm not sure I answer, but feel free to ask me questions at the end. Okay, so now we're just moving into like the mechanics of growth, okay? You've sold your, you've got a client, you're selling, you figured out how you're gonna bill and collect, how you're gonna deliver. Deliver means usually headcount, adding people to your team probably already added a few salespeople. You probably started with your R&D team, getting your shred and NRC IRAP money to build out your products, your technologies, your software, and now you're actually running this out. And this KPIs becomes just the, you know, the rhythm within the organization, month to month, okay? That speaks to just your investors, like, okay, this, we understand our key KPIs. You know, the correlation of the tons of available pomace to revenue becomes quite an easy KPI, right? Seasonality or anything else that would correlate to those KPIs. Customer acquisition costs, right? Like <laughs> hiring a sales team, developing your website, putting out your brochures, going to trade shows and conferences, and doing demos and presenting your software. All of that sales, it's all expenses. You haven't sold anything yet. Then you're selling, okay? That's customer acquisition costs. You need to be able to tell all of that story. And yeah, it's buried in your financial model, but it is the essence of your financial model, okay? So that's, that's why I'm kind of highlighting it. And as you produce your, your, your submission for your, your um, application for the competition, these are pertinent questions, okay? This is how it all ties together. Churn then, right? Back to this point of, okay, we delivered our products. Is this something the customer satisfied? That's why customer one is so relevant, okay? Even to the example of patents, I was saying to Angie, like, if I could get all the money spent on patents in the historical portfolio of my clientele that never generated a penny of revenue, I'd be a multimillionaire, right? It's often done too early. Too much enamored with how amazing your, uh, Cynthia even hit it on, like your patenting stuff, it's um, potentially amazing, but it's not commercially available yet. Well, it's much better, as she even said, like to, to, to just keep it trade secret, right? Why are you gonna spend, like once you start patenting things in multiple jurisdictions around the world, trust me, being there, it's very expensive, okay? And so the issue is, is, is more like, are you selling something? Have you gotten to this point of even understanding that they're willing to pay for the IP, right? Like that's, these are other really relevant things. It'd be an interesting statistic to run, you know, the patent, US Patent Office and see how, many, how much intellectual property is booked there has never generated any revenue at all. I'd, I'd, be, I'd suspect it's huge. So anyway, that's a side story, but it's, th this is a piece of the, Okay, of course you want intellectual property. Why do you want a patent in the first place? Let me ask that question. So you can defend it. And yep. you can go to litigation. And then it's in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're skipped down to the litigation. Hopefully you don't have to go there in the first place. But what you're trying to do, and which all of you would probably already be doing as part of it, you're trying to avoid competition, right? Because if you don't have any competition, 
And we see it in the biotech space. I'm actively involved in a lot of biotech companies, so a lot of patent protection, as well as also the controversy of you sell it for a very, very high price. And for whatever, 18 odd years, you have patent protection. Nobody can do it. So you can charge kind of whatever you want. I use that loosely, right? At the end of the day, the customers have to be willing to pay. As it relates to health, we pay a lot. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll give you the mic, but also Sean, time has flown by. It's oh yeah, okay, I will, I'm, I'm almost there, okay. slides. Okay, so in, in that topic, if somebody has an idea, they, they wanna commercialize, but it's gonna involve other players, you know, you need to start talking to people. And let's say you don't wanna go to the patent right now because you don't even know how you're gonna do this. How does the person kind of protect themselves from somebody else that's more, let's say, experienced, a very smart salesperson or a VP or a director of somehow taking that idea and running with it? Yep. Uh, Non-disclosure agreements are very common when you're getting to a collaborative partnership of that nature, mutually. So it's basically commercial term non-disclosure agreements. So if you start to work with something and you are revealing your intellectual property, whether it's patented or not, like that, it doesn't matter, it's yours. So that's, that's what you do. When it gets to that point where you're you know, having that meaningful conversation, I would also say, and a lot of investors will, will probably echo this thought because they, they won't sign NDAs. Like I think there's a little bit of an, an, all entrepreneurs are enamored with how great their own technology is. So they think everyone's gonna steal what they're building. The world doesn't work that way, for the most part, at least in my observation. So, so th there's a couple of things, but the fast answer is, yeah, an NDA. If you're talking about real meaningful stuff with people who are sophisticated enough to take what you're doing and do it better than you, like that's actually another really important thing, is that if you're terrified that somebody is better at building your technology than you are, you got a big problem. Okay, that's back to the thought leader, be confident. It's like, I'm the best person to build this business and you know, if they do something, I'm gonna be able to do it twice as better. Like it's a little bit of a confidence thing there, a little bit. Okay, last slide, how, how much time do I have? Like five minutes? Okay, perfect, okay, so we're kind of at the last stage of this cycle, okay? We built it and yeah, we'll quickly look at financial statements. So this is a, but what I'm telling you here is the story, the story behind your numbers is what everyone's looking for. Okay, at the end of the day, it's gonna look at like the next slide, but this is the final thing, like what's the value then? And the value is in the, putting it all together and showing that as you invest into these things, you decide to leave your day job and commit to build this and ask for the IRAP money to come in and give you some help hiring a few people and you ask all, uh, investors to come in and put money in because you got your rich aunt or uncle to put some money in to support your first round of funding, that's all plays into because they think they're gonna make a return on your, in investing in your business. So what's your valuation today? On incorporation, what's the value of your business? Question? Zero. Zero. Uh, no. Perfect, a dollar. The, you go to you, Baskins and you corporate your company, it's called Founder Shares. It's point zero 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 one per share. That's the start of your business. You're worth nothing. The minute you leave the office, perhaps the company's worth a million dollars. Elon Musk incorporates a company, it's probably worth considerably more. Right? But, and this is the start of your valuation. Then you get your financial statements, your business model, you put it all together, and at the end of the day, it's like the net present value. Do I even have it on here? Just, no, I don't. It's the net present value of all future cash flows. So it's like you went to buy a GIC or a bond from, at the end of the day, it's the business. It's a business, it'll generate revenues in the future. If I can discount to today's date what the net present value of all the future earnings of your perpetual business are, that's your value today. Okay, the only way to do that is to produce a set of financial statements that tells a story that's believable, has a risk profile, but with all of that, you could hire a CB, uh, uh, 
certified business valuator, they would charge you an arm and a leg, but at the end of the day, they do exactly what I just told you, and they give you a value. Okay, that's it. This is what we're looking at at the end of the day. We'll share this. This is a profit and loss set of financial statements. Revenues, three products, a primary offering, secondary services, and COGS, cost of sales for each. And then you got gross margins for each over year, prior year actuals and projections out three to four years. And then you have functional P&L, R&D, sales and marketing, general and administrative facilities. Not by type, like not wages, okay, wages, you know, software costs, all of those things. You're not doing a tax return. You're presenting financial statements for investment. You got to invest people you hire to do sales, people to build your products, R&D, people to support your products and services. Lay it out this way. And I emphasize the top half is where the real story is. Okay? You don't have to have a litany of all these other costs. You just need to show, and it all grows. It's about growth. Okay, that's, that's kind of it. KPIs at the bottom. Balance sheet, often neglected, which is just, okay, I start with zero dollars in my bank account or maybe $10,000 that your rich uncle put into your business. And then like, when do you need to raise capital and who are you hiring and how does it all play out? Cash flows, probably better shown here. Shareholder loans. Um, so you might need an accountant to help you with this, but to be honest, it's not that difficult. Okay. Concluding remarks is just, I didn't get into the mechanics of GAAP, IFRS. It's simpler than that. It is the essence of what I'm trying to be explaining. And that's what you need to be able to tell in your financial model. Okay? Okay? Enlighten the judges. Kind of be this thought leader. Show us that you know how the numbers all work. And then it's like, okay, you're sophisticated enough to do that. Go find a public company in your domain. It's all available. Cynthia mentioned like US patent offices and the trademark offices. Well, there's CDAR and SEC.gov, uh, Edgar for US finance. There's public company financial statements out the yin yang if you want to go look at what they look like. And that's a good idea. Okay, then you can see you know, key metrics, what other companies in the comparative space are. And then Google, <laughs> Google. Like she also said, like go out and find what are competitors, what are they doing, mimic what you like, do things differently where they're not living up to expectations, and that becomes a very investable story. That's okay. uh, I got one quick question from online, then we'll wrap it up. Um, so pre-revenue company, how much of your ground up financial model do you or should you share with investors, given your pre-revenue, which means it's Projections. It, it doesn't matter. Pre-revenue, you absolutely need to show when revenue occurs. That's where you just do it in Excel. It's just theoretical, right? Just because you're pre-revenue doesn't mean that you're not going to get to revenue. And no one's going to invest in your company without you being able to articulate, well, what does revenue look like? So biotech company, you won't see revenue for 10 years, right? But you, you know it. Everybody, you produce the financials. I've built a number of models for, for drug development companies. And yeah, it's way out there. But you have to know what you're aiming for. So pre-revenues, all your concepts, you have to be able to articulate when is it? Is it 14 years from year? Is it next month? Is it a year from now? Because all of this does what? It drives the net present value of your value. Right? And if you can't put it on the thing, then your value is back to, well, zero. <laughs> so yeah, it's very important to, uh, to put it all together in a package. It doesn't mean there's risk, right? Like that's the other point. It's like, of course, you're just, this is your best estimates with some sensitivities. Worst case scenario, best case scenario, this is where, yes, it'll get to a more sophisticated level than what I've articulated here, but it starts with this. And you absolutely have to have the full picture together so that an investor will take you seriously. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. We're going to cut this for break, but Sean will stick around during the break to talk. So first, thank you very much, Sean. My pleasure. Thank you.